Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up later in the show, we'll hear a song from Keith Bear. But first, joining us right now is North Dakota Senate Majority Leader Bob Stingham. Senator, thanks for joining us hey, today. Hey, good evening. Thank you. Well, as we get started, t tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I'm uh, obviously Bob Stingham. I've been in the Senate since I was elected in 1992, so I've served since 1993. And I've always represented a portion of Bismarck, about a quarter of Bismarck from District 30, always in that district. Okay. Well, now, what, uh, where were you from originally? And uh, Well, our families always lived in North Dakota, and as a young man, I grew up in Mohall and Williston, and uh, I moved. we moved to Bismarck in about 1965, and I've been in Bismarck ever since 1965. Well, now, what got you interested in uh, serving in the state legislature? Well, you know, it's kind of a uh, family that's been really involved in politics back from the days of my grandparents, and I can remember just as a very young lad, sitting around the, the table at my grandparents' place talking about politics and them telling us what's going on and you know obviously that filtered down into my parents and my parents always we talk politics at the table and probably brother Wayne started the big political move and mm -hmm. ran for the house back in the 70s and and then uh, along the way brother Al got in the house from the Wapiton area Wayne was from Grand Forks and pretty soon then I came along from Bismarck and for two sessions, there were three Stengen brothers serving in the legislature. Since then, obviously, they've ditched me, and I'm the only one left. <laughs> well, all right. With that said, well, let's talk about a little bit. Uh, we, we've got a lot of different subject matters maybe to touch on, but what do you think are some of the big issues that are going to be coming up in this 2011 legislative session? Well, you always know it's money, money, and money. But aside from that, I think uh, some of the huge issues are going to be we got to talk about the infrastructure in western North Dakota as it relates to oil, the oil industry. We have problems in the Devil's Lake area with flooding, and we have water problems in the valley, and in, especially in the Fargo area. So we're going to have to deal with those issues this session. Well, okay, and, and we're going to get into some of those. So let's just start picking apart some of the different things that are going on. Uh, the passage of Measure 1, uh, is this a good thing for the state or not? Well, I supported Measure 1. I supported it, uh, the one that uh, the voters voted down previous to that. I think this time it was arranged in such a manner that it's prudent to save some of the money as we have uh, the extra dollars rolling in. And that's what the voters wanted. They voted for that. That passed by a pretty good majority. So <clears throat> I think it's incumbent on us as legislators now to work within that framework. And I think it'll be very good for North Dakota. And it will kind of shelter us from some of the times when times get really, really tough. And I remember in the 80s and even early in my career in 93, 95 sessions of the legislature, if we came back and had a $10 million ending fund balance when we came into the next session, we were lucky. And we had to make some across the board cuts in programs and, and we couldn't increase K-12 funding like maybe we would have liked to because we didn't have the money. And this can give us that buffer to not have to do that. Okay, well, I know. Well, can you explain, though, how this is going to work and what kind of oversight and decision-making the legislature will have o over this? And I guess it won't really start until 2017, if I'm... Correct. At this point in time, a percentage of the revenues from the oil uh, extraction tax and production taxes will go into a trust fund, and it'll sit there and it'll grow until 2017. At that time, the legislature could access that money if times are tough. And I believe, I really truly do believe that if times were tough and we didn't have money to continue our budget, you would have no problem getting a two-thirds vote in the House and Senate to spend some of this money. It will stop you from taking it all at one time, but you can be able to take a pretty good chunk. And there can be a sizable amount of money in there by 2017. And nobody can tell us what the oil industry is going to do right now. You know, in the 80s, I remember those very, very well. This was going to last forever, and it didn't. And they tell us now that in 2010, this is going to go on for a long time. I certainly hope it does, and it looks like it will, but you don't know. Yes, sir. Uh, how about the, just I'll talk about the oil industry a little bit. Uh, you know, the infrastructure needs in, in oil country out in the western part. I hear a lot about, uh, especially the roads being torn up and, and uh, issues there with smaller towns uh, sort of having trouble coping with maybe booms in population and things. Can, can you speak to that a little bit? Well, a few weeks back we did taken, I did along with the 
uh, House Majority Leader Al Carlson and our Finance and Tax Committee Chair did take a tour of the oil country and we went through Stanley and Williston, Watford City and we drove some of those roads in the oil patches. We could see what was happening. There is a huge influx of people into those areas and it is truly an impact to those communities. Uh, I'm sure they would have rather it happened more gradually than it did, but bang, all of a sudden you have all these people there. And it is putting a strain on those communities, especially the roads. And when you start talking about the roads, they have developed this oil field and they've developed the technology to the point where they're telling us they can drill a well in less than 30 days, in less than a month. And remember, they're drilling about 150, or there's 150 rigs out there at one time, so they're drilling 150 new rigs a month. Each one of those rigs requires 1,200 trucks of various types of, you know, water, sand, fuel, pipes, whatever, the materials they need. But you take 1,200 trucks times 150 rigs a month times 12 months, all of a sudden you start talking a huge amount of traffic mm -hmm. and drive those roads. You know, we uh, were working on Highway 2 going into Williston, and I can remember early on in my legislative career the arguments about four-laning Highway 2. At that time, nobody talked about the oil industry because it wasn't there. And they finally got Highway 2 four lanes. Thank goodness when you look at the oil uh, stuff going on up in that area that it is four lane. Mm -hmm. And now they have that problem between Williston and Watford City. So yeah, e and then even more so is the gravel roads that are out there that go to those well sites. I think the oil industry has stepped up to the plate in many, many cases. They've done a good job helping to uh, work on those roads and we need to address all those. We did a bunch of it last session. We put a lot of money into the roads and the infrastructure out there in western North Dakota, and we need to continue to look at that. Okay. Well, I understand, too, there might be a request from Williston for, uh, for to construct a $150 million sort of pipeline to develop, to deliver water uh, to, the, to the oil fields. Any thoughts on this that you have? Well, we, you know, we, when we stopped in Williston and talked to the, the uh, people in Williston, that, they brought that up. and. That water line that they're talking is an expansion of the water treatment plant that they have in Williston and they want to bring water down into the Watford, actually to Watford City for one, plus into the oil field in that area. I think the assistance that they probably need is assistance on how they're going to fund this thing and then they need to figure out how they're going to pay for that. And I, The oil industry is willing to pay for the water and I think they need to look at how do they figure a rate structure and uh, figure out how that they're going to pay for that infrastructure. Okay. Well, Senator, you know, let's, let's change a little bit now. Obviously, uh, uh, Governor Hoven stepping down, uh, new governor with uh, Governor Dalrymple, of course, uh, former lieutenant governor, I guess. What differences, if any, do you expect to see uh, compared to what you got used to with Governor Hoven uh, to Governor Dalrymple and, and sort of the budget and the process? Well, you know, I think everybody is an individual and, and Governor Hoven now, Senator Hoven, you know, he has a different personality than, than uh, Governor Dalrymple will have. Uh, they are different. Uh, Jack comes with a bit more legislative experience. So he's, he's, lived, he's lived in our shoes, so he knows what we have to deal with as a legislature. Sometimes, sometimes I felt that uh, Governor Hoven maybe didn't quite understand how it worked in the legislature. It's, you know, we got to sell these ideas to our caucuses and our people, it isn't always that easy. Okay. And I think Jack understands that. Well, have you had much time to, to, to speak with Governor Dalrymple and, and uh, so far? Well, I haven't talked to Governor Dalrymple a whole lot yet. You know, obviously we worked in the Senate for all the years that I was, you know, majority leader in the Senate, so I do kind of know uh, Governor Dalrymple fairly well. Okay, with that then, what do you think about his appointment of uh, Drew Wrigley as uh, the new lieutenant governor? Well, I think Drew Wrigley is an excellent person. He's very intelligent. Uh, he'll have a little bit himself to learn about the legislative process. I think he'll be an excellent and quick study on the legislative process, but it will be something new. He's not used to that. He didn't come out of the legislature. Not that you have to do that, but you know, it does give you a leg up, I think, if you've come out of that process and you've been involved in it a little bit. But he'll catch on quickly. State surplus, uh, still strong. Uh, and I expect you'll be getting a lot of requests uh, from agencies for, for money. Uh, what's sort of your view on how to manage this surplus? I think we need to continue in the, in the same method that we have been doing for the last several 
uh, bienniums through the last several years, we have tried to take the approach that we need to have a sustainable budget. We need to be budgeting, and if government's growing, it has to grow not larger than the rate of what our revenues are growing. We've tried to manage that. Uh, you know, maybe we spent a little bit too much money, but at least we had the money to spend. And I think at least I'm going to continue in that light is to make sure that we're proposing a budget and government is going to be sustainable rather than to bring us in the spot that Minnesota is in or California or some of these other states. We're lucky to be, well, I shouldn't say we're lucky to be where we are. It was a bunch of skill, but I'm glad we are where we are. With that said, and you talked about 93, 95, your first years in, is it harder during a session when you have money to work with or when you don't have as much money to work with? I mean, because obviously you've got to then be smarter about how to, how to use that money. It is way harder when you have the money than when you don't. When you don't, when you plain old don't have the money, people don't come asking you for the money. And when you have it, you know, you have to sort out your priorities. And some people are going to come for money and programs and things that, you know, sometimes we really don't need. But, and they probably wouldn't come to you except that they think you have the money there. Mm -hmm. Well, with that said, what do, you, what do you expect this session? Do you expect a, a long, contentious session? Or, well, what, how, do you, how do you look at it? Well, I'm sure there will be the contentious issues that we have to face. There will certainly be, in my opinion, a struggle to figure out exactly how we're going to spend the dollars that we're going to spend. You know, and there's numbers between $700 million surplus and a billion dollar surplus. And, you know, when you start whittling around with that just a little bit and you understand that to sustain the property tax relief that we did last session, it's going to take about $340 million this time. So subtract that from a billion dollars. We're going to need 150 or more million dollars just to fund our human services and our Social Security and those or not social security, but our social programs at the same level without increasing them as we are today. Uh, we plan on doing some things with K-12. And you know, you start working with all these and you can put some money in the infrastructure in the West and deal with Devil's Lake and Fargo and pretty soon, you know what, there isn't very much money left. And we need to be prudent with that. Well, with that said, the Republicans uh, continue to hold a uh, strong majority in, in both houses. But what do you expect to see in bills and initiatives uh, from the Democrats? Well, you know, it's, and I don't want to say anything bad about the Democrats, but when you are in a, whatever party is the minority, it's a whole lot easier to, you know, put in a bill because money is no object when you're in the minority. You don't have to worry about how you're going to pay for it or how it's going to fit into the budget. All you have to do is have the idea. And people like to get something for nothing. So... It's real easy to put in bills, so there will be plenty of spending bills and ideas on how to spend money and more health insurance programs and more whatever. There will be plenty of those. Well, let's, let's uh, go through some of, the, some of the issues, and you've talked about some of them or presented them. Obviously, flood control in the Red River Valley uh, has been a big issue in the past uh, few years especially. What role do you see the legislature playing in this? Well, we, you know, last session we put some money into, and I don't remember exactly what the dollar amount was into the flood control in the Red River Valley, and there's going to be a sizable amount of money to, to do whatever diversion plan that they decide in the valley that they're going to do mm -hmm. specifically. So I would suspect that the legislature is going to be asked to participate in that in some manner, okay. financially anyway. Uh, and then what about Devil's Lake area? Well, you know, Devil's Lake has the same thing. They're, you know, they're going to have to figure out what they're going to do with this outlet thing or somebody's going to have to pray for it to quit raining up there. I mean, uh, I've never seen it. Every, it. Just the water keeps coming up there and it keeps filling up the lake. It's increased tremendously. It's huge. Uh, so we're going to have to figure out what we're going to do with that outlet structure. Mm -hmm. And then how about the human uh, services budget? Well, here's part of the problem with North Dakota. You know, it's like a double-edged sword. We do so well, and our income is growing. There be part of it's good farming, and it's, you know, the prices are up on our commodities. There's there's money coming in from the oil patch out there, and you know, it wasn't too many years ago. I think we were getting a 70% match from the federal government on our human services and what we call the FMAP. Well, our income's growing. We're doing well, and now that match is going to be 50-50. And when we do that. It's going to cost us millions, hundreds of millions of dollars more. So 
it's going to be tougher for us, and we got to scrutinize and make sure we need to do every program that we have. Okay. Uh, a number of bills that we sort of talked about, uh, the, the smoking, a smoking ban, I guess. Uh, what about that one? Well, we did talk about, you know, before we got started, a bunch of bills. Yes, I believe that there will, someone will be introducing, I don't know who it is, somebody I'm sure will introduce a statewide smoking ban, along with text messaging, texting and driving, I think that one will be in. I'm sure there will be a bill in a deal with uh, graduated driver's license for the younger kids. Uh, we've been bullying, we've talked about a bullying. Yes, they've, people have been talking about that. That bill has been, uh, will be introduced. I know I talked to the Attorney General. I have an inside track with the guy, <laughs> but I talked to him and he has been studying that bullying and, and they will have some recommendations and things to do as it relates to that. Well, let's turn, I guess, a little bit uh, maybe to education. How about K through 12 education? Well, you know, we've always tried to increase that, and I think there will be a, a reasonable increase in the funding to K-12 education. It's always been a top priority in the legislature, and it will continue to be so this session. Uh, and then, of course, you can also then you, you go up to higher education. There's always seems to be struggles and uh, challenges there with higher education and their budget requests. Well, and I'll stick my neck out a little bit. Yes, I've been disappointed with higher ed, and, and I don't think I'm alone in the legislature. I think we've been let down with some of the things that have gone on in higher ed. Uh, they've had some pretty sizable increases in their budget the last few bienniums, and I know this time they're looking at over a, at least a 20% increase and a 5 and 5 for their employees, and I think they're going to have a tough time getting that to fly. Hmm. With that said, uh, I just wonder, have you met uh, the new NDSU president yet? No, I have not met him. Okay, well, but with that, uh, so do you have any impressions of him? Or, and maybe I could ask the follow-up question here. You know, how, how does NDSU go about repairing some of the, uh, maybe trust is the best word to call it, that was lost during sort of President Chapman's home construction and then his departure there? Well, you know, it's not just NDSU's situation. It, you know, that is probably the biggest one that was there with his home construction thing. They had a few problems up in Grand Forks mm -hmm. themselves. And I think it's overall, at least with me in the legislature, it's overall rebuilding any of that trust with the higher ed system that's out there. I, you know, sometimes feel that we in the legislature, we're the policy making branch of government, we set the policy and we go home and expect them to follow the policy and when it doesn't get followed the way we intend it to do, I have a little trust problem there. And they're going to have to work at mending that with me. Okay. Well, then how about the tax rates? You mentioned taxes earlier, but they're fairly low in North Dakota. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the tax issue for, for this session? Well, we're, we're going to address the property tax again as we set money aside last session to handle the tax, you know, the property tax issue. I would suspect you're going to see some things with income tax, both personal and corporate income tax. Uh, maybe another reduction in those. Uh, we want to keep the tax rates low in North Dakota. We believe that that's certainly part of the huge benefit that we have in North Dakota, and that's part of what draws the business to North Dakota. Yeah. We also talked about, uh, will, will redistricting be an issue for this session? <laughs> well, you know, I'm happy to say that the Republicans control both chambers and the governor's office, which makes it a lot more beneficial to us in the redistricting because we'll be in charge of redrawing the district boundaries. There will be a bill, a redistricting bill, set up this legislative session that will identify a committee that will be set up to bring to the legislature, and that's what they do. They come in with their recommendations on where these district boundaries will be drawn, and it will come to the legislature. We will have a special session of the legislature sometime in November, I would suspect. The date hasn't been set, but in that time frame, we'll probably come back for, well, I know we have to come back for a special session and redraw the district boundaries as is the, you know, the federal law says we have to do it, and we'll do it. Yeah. Well, Senator, with our <coughs> listeners and, and viewers out there, uh, I mean, how does it work in North Dakota? It, when a bill is brought forward, it, it, does it carry through to both houses, or can you explain the process a little bit for us? We have a very open and simple process in North Dakota. Every single bill that's introduced in the legislature will have a hearing in at least one of the two houses, whatever house it's introduced in. That bill will have a hearing, and that bill is required to be voted on on the floor of that chamber. And obviously, if it passes that chamber, then it'll go over to the other one. But you can't stop one in the committee. You can't 
slide it in the door, whatever. Every bill has to come before the floor of the legislature and be voted on. Okay. Well, you know, can you talk, let's go back to the economy just a little bit. Why is North Dakota's economy continued to be solid despite the, the, the national trend, the downward uh, uh, turn that it's had? I mean, has it just been the oil money and, and uh, of course, good farm prices, or have there been other issues? Well, it's not just one thing, I don't think. I think part of it is that we've been very prudent in the last three, four, five sessions of the legislature that we've tried to keep our expenditures in line with our revenues. When we do that, it's a very favorable conditions for businesses to, to grow in a state like that, and that's what we've done here. Now, our oil prices, definitely, and the revenues we've got from oil are very important. That helps. Farm commodity prices are higher, and not only that, but the weather's cooperated, so the farmers are getting a decent uh, crops are coming in, the yield is high, the quality is good, so that helps. And all that happens and people are spending money and the oil industry is spending money, people are buying things, our sales taxes, revenues are up a little bit. Uh, you know, all of that adds to the good economy in North Dakota. Well, Senator, you talked about the 80s that you'd seen, you've seen a boom and a bust, I guess. And of course the boom right now, I mean, we really are having trouble getting uh, service employees and into North Dakota and I mean what are we doing to help uh, try to, to to have you know these different organizations whether it's towns restaurants hotels uh, to have enough people to work with well I think uh, job services and our in our groups in the state have done a lot of things to try to entice people to come up to North Dakota and go to work out in these fields the oil industry is really kind of catered to some of their employees it is tough for those communities it's really hard to find a the necessary workers, and even more important, that probably the places for them to stay. You know, you've seen, I saw these big man camps up there, and I'm not <laughs> sure that that's where I'd want to live, but, you know, and they're working with it. And, and Williston, you watch the growth in Williston, they're adding new apartments, they're adding new houses, they're they're building that infrastructure up. So finally, if people want more information from you or about the state or anything that we've talked about here, where's the best place for them to go? Absolutely, the best place for people to go out there is to nd.gov and follow the links in there. You can go to the, the executive branch offices, you can go to the legislative offices, you can go and see where the district boundaries are so you can see what district you're in. You can get your get a picture of your legislator, in fact, and get all their, their pertinent email addresses and probably even their phone number. I mean, North Dakota is probably the most open legislature that I've, you know, and I've been all over that I've seen where you can actually call your legislator. Well, Senator, I'm sorry we're out of time, but thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you very much. Stay tuned for more. Keith Bear is a world-renowned Mandan, Hidatsa storyteller and musician from the three affiliated tribes in Fort Berthold, North Dakota. In this piece, enjoy one of Keith's songs. Oh, my honey, don't you know that I'll be with you tonight? We'll go walking by the water, we'll hold hands in the moonlight. Play I ha ya ha de o yo ha de o ya he do. Way I ya ha de o yo ha de o ya he do. Out down by the river where the water flows cold and clear. I'll whisper sweet words to you, honey, words you want to hear. Way I ha ya ha de o yo ha de o ya he do. Way I ya ha de o yo ha de o ya he do. Honey, in the evening. When the sweet grass smells so strong, go walking by the willows, honey, there I'll lay you down. Way I ha ya ha de o yo ha de o ya he do. Way I ya ha de o yo ha de o ya he do. Honey, don't you know that I'll be with you tonight? We'll go walking by the water, we'll make love till morning light. Way I ha ya ha de o yo ha de o ya he do. Oi ah ya ha de o yo ha de o ya he do, oi ho ya he do, oi ho ya he do.
Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching.